Hello, fellow Whovians. How are you all doing on this very fine day or night, depending on when you're listening to this? So, this is the very first episode in the Holy Whovian History podcast, um, in which I will basically be going through each era of Doctor Who and just sort of talking about the history of it. Um, after that, I do have other things planned, but that is the main sort of roadmap for now. So, shall we begin? In December 1962, Canadian-born Sidney Newman arrived at BBC Television as the new head of drama. Now, Newman was a science fiction fan, and he'd overseen several such productions in his previous positions at ABC Weekend TV and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In March 1963, he was made aware by Baverstock, who was now promoted to controller of programmes, of a gap in the schedule on Saturday evenings between the Sports Showcase Grandstand and the pop music programme Jukebox Jury. Now, ideally, any programme scheduled here would appeal to children that had previously been accustomed to the slight time slot, the teenaged audience of Jukebox Jury and the adult sports fan audience of Grandstand. Newman decided that a science fiction programme would be perfect to fill the gap and enthusiastically took up the existing script department research, initiating several brainstorming sessions with Wilson, Braben, Fick, Frick, and another BBC staff writer, C.E. Webber. Now, Webber's first outline document about the series, which is dated the 29th of March 1963, envisioned the show, which was tentatively titled The Troubleshooters, being driven by a group of Earth-based contemporary humans who are constantly conflicting with a recurring foe. I like Power Rangers? Not really, because they didn't recur. Anyway, Newman would then personally come up with the idea of an educational series featuring a time machine that was bigger on the inside and the idea of the central character, the mysterious Doctor Who. And he may also have given the series the same title. Now, however, there is evidence to contradict this. In a 1971 interview, Donald Wilson claimed to have named the series, and when this claim was put to Newman, he did not dispute it. Where the second outline, now calling the series Doctor Who, hmm, followed an amnesiac, frail old man lost in space and time, with a machine which enabled him to travel together through time, through space, and through matter. The character of Doctor Who was described as being suspicious and capable of sudden malignance, disliking his other supporting characters and hating scientific progress, with his secret mission to meddle with time and destroy the future, while his time machine was described as unreliable and being invisible. Hmm, invisible. Why would anybody see it then? How would the companions get in if it was invisible? Hmm. Sidney Newman pencils in a rejection of the character's description, as he didn't want the main character of the series to be a reactionary, but more like a father figure who would take science, applied and theoretical, as being as natural as eating. Now, he also disliked the idea of an invisible time machine, saying that a more tangible symbol was needed, but he was enthusiastic about the idea of the time machine's unreliability. In addition, Weather suggested ways Doctor Who's identity could develop. Now, he suggested Bethlehem as a location for a Christmas story, and Doctor Who as Merlin, as Jacob Marley, and his wife as Cinderella's godmother chasing her husband through time. They all sound a bit bonkers, don't they? Hmm. Newman wasn't keen on the proposed direction for the series, neither am I, writing, I don't like this much, it reads silly and condescending. It doesn't get across the basis of teaching and educational experience. Drama based upon and stemming from factual material and scientific phenomena and actual social history of past and future. The final memo detailing the format of the series, written written by Wilson, Weather and Newman and dated the 16th of May 1963, described the character of Doctor Who as a 650 years old man whose watery blue eyes are continually looking around in bewilderment and occasionally a look of utter malevolence clouds his face as he suspects his earthly friends of being part of some conspiracy. He seems not to remember where he comes from, but he has flashes of garbled memory which indicate that he was involved in a galactic war. I wonder when they'd reuse that idea, and still fears pursuit by some undefined enemy. His ship is also described as a police telephone box, but anyone entering it finds himself inside an extensive electronic contravance. 
though it looks impressive, it is an old beat-up model which Doctor Who stole, no, they're calling him Doctor Who, when he escaped from his own galaxy in the year 5733. It is uncertain in performance. Moreover, Doctor Who isn't quite sure how to work it. Okay, so they have to learn by trial and error. Later in the year, production was initiated and handed over to producer Verity Lambert and story editor David Whittaker to oversee, after a brief period when the show had been handled by a caretaker producer, Rex Tucker. Concerned about Lambert's relative lack of experience, Wilson appointed the experienced staff director Mervyn Pinfield as associate producer. Australian staff writer Anthony Colburn also contributed, penning the very first episode from a draft initially prepared by Weber. Now, Doctor Who was originally intended to be an educational series, with the TARDIS taking the form of an object from that particular episode's time period. For example, a column in ancient Greece, a sarcophagus in Egypt, etc, etc. When the show's budget was calculated, however, it was discovered that it was prohibit prohibitively expensive to redress the TARDIS model for each episode. Instead, the TARDIS's chameleon circuit was said to be malfunctioning, giving the prop its characteristic police box appearance. So if you think about it, that really iconic sort of image of Doctor Who, the blue box, the TARDIS, was simply an idea of convenience, something that we will late that we will come across a little bit later on. Now, the series' theme music, Iconic, was written by film, film and television composer Ron Grainer, who would later go on to also compose the theme to The Prisoner, among other things, in collaboration with the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. While Grainer wrote the theme, it was Delia Derbyshire who was responsible for its creation, using a series of tape recorders to laboriously cut and join together the individual sounds she created with both concrete sources and square and sine wave oscillators. Um, one well, fact that I think is quite cool that they um, the TARDIS sound was literally generated from um, scratching Ron's car keys against um, some chords like along like a chords of a harp or something and I think that's just really weird and wacky I love it um, yeah Grainer was amazed by the results and asks did I write that when he heard it Darby replied that he mostly had now, the BBC, who wanted to keep members of the workshop anonymous for some reason, prevented Derbyshire from getting a co-composer credit and half the royalties. Like, I don't know why. It's sort of a situation like um, the creation of Batman. Like, it's always Bob, Cray Bob Kane who is uh, associated with the creation of Batman. Um, but only recently they've started saying Bob Kane with Bill Finger, because obviously Bill Finger is great and composed and help design Batman. Anyway, the title sequence was designed by graphics designer Bernard Lodge and realised by electronics effects specialist Norman Taylor. Now all the sort of the back story and prep was done for Doctor Who, it was time to actually find the Doctor. And this I shall cover in the next part of the Holy Whovian History podcast, which will focus on William Hartnell himself. Now, if you want a bit more of a sort of backstory behind all this, then I strongly recommend you watch the documentary An Adventure in Space in Time, which is a dramatisation of the making of Doctor Who, and it is fabulous. Stars David Bradley as William Hartnell, Jessica Rain as uh, Verity Lambert, and so forth. It's just really great. Give it a watch. So yeah, that's all from me uh, this time around, folks, but make sure to stay tuned for episode two. Thank you very much. I've been a rack nerd and you've been an amazing audience. Allons-y!